welcome everybody to uh, what has been a, a very long break uh, from from streaming for me, but I'm back um, and hoping to get back into the, the flow of things. Um, I sent out a, a tweet on the Twitters asking people what they uh, wanted to, to see and um, out of the three choices that I gave, um, showing a Redis client uh, built on top of uh, async standard was the winner. So we're going to do that today. Um, just a little bit about how I hope uh, to uh, conduct this stream and things like that. Um, uh, there, uh, there are other streams that exist out there um, uh, that uh, I think do a great job of showing both uh, beginner and um, more advanced or advanced intermediate. And I'm hoping to hit the sweet spot of, of intermediate. You've gone through uh, the Rust uh, programming language book before. You've probably written some programs, but you wouldn't call yourself an expert. Um, and uh, particularly for today, probably you've never looked into async standard before. Maybe you've not even looked at any of the async stuff in Rust before, um, but you're wanting to learn more. Um, that's kind of uh, what we're going to be talking about today. Um, Redis, uh, or creating a Redis client is actually a super simple thing to do. It's not that complicated. Um, and so there, there won't be a ton going on, but hopefully that's a, a good excuse for us to, to go down and, and look what this, what this looks like. Um, I was thinking about how I wanted to write this and I thought perhaps what I will do is also go down some, um, wrong paths, um, doing some things that I've done in the past that I know will end up in, in bad places, um, just to show, um, you know, what troubles you might run into. And particularly with, uh, with async await, since it's so new, there are definitely some corner cases where um, you'll run into um, that will kind of stop you dead in the tracks if you don't know what exactly to do uh, otherwise. Um, it looks like chat also has uh, some suggestions there, like uh, async standard versus Tokyo, a comparison. I can talk a little bit about that, but I'm by no means an expert in either one of them. So I can just give you my personal opinion and first thoughts, um, having used both uh, not for production use cases, um, and then uh, a little bit more about runtimes and stuff like that. So um, let me switch over uh, to my desktop. So hopefully everybody can still see me down here, down below. Um, and uh, what we're going to be uh, looking at is, is of course Redis, but what we're going to be building on top of is this thing called async standard. And just for, for those who don't know what async standard is, um, async standard is a, uh, a runtime for uh, basically asynchronously executing um, Rust code, um, and as it says here in the tagline, it's an async version of the Rust standard library. So basically, it tries to mimic the API of the standard library and just give asynchronous uh, versions of it. Um, Rust, unlike other programming languages, does not come with its own kind of uh, asynchronous runtime built in um, or, uh, or event loop or anything like that, like you might expect if you're coming from Node or something like that. So we kind of have to explicitly set up a runtime um, and, and execute our futures on top of that, that runtime. Um, and chat was just asking, is this a, an alternative to Tokyo um, or an addition on top? So this is a, an alternative to Tokyo. They, they kind of hit the, the same spots, um, are trying to do similar things. Um, and really the difference between the two is how they expose their, their APIs. So uh, async standard is is built to mimic the Rust standard library. Tokyo has an API that doesn't um, really do that and has some um, some uh, some different choices in how it exposes uh, its API. Um, also, async standard is built on top of Futures RS, which is the the crate that was kind of um, originally set up to experiment with futures um, and then futures, the, the future trait was moved into the standard library, um, but there's some, the future uh, trait inside of the standard library is very bare bones. It doesn't really do a lot. 
Um, and so the Futures RS uh, crate is still comes with a whole bunch of other stuff built on top of, of those Futures um, that add functionality to the, to the standard Futures trait. Um, and async standard is, uh, is kind of running on top of that, whereas Tokyo is sort of doing its own thing um, with that. Um, as far as why I picked the, to do this one in async standard and not in Tokyo is basically because I think there's already been a lot of stuff on Tokyo before, so let's show off the alternative. That's, that's one thing. I also personally like the philosophy of async standard better for the reasons that I just said. Mimicking the standard library, I think, is just a kind of obviously good choice um, for how to expose the API. and. Um, futures RS, there has to be some kind of crate that makes um, talking between runtimes um, compatible. Um, there was there was talk before that that was supposed to be Futures RS. It seems Tokyo will not be going down that route. I haven't personally seen them offer an alternative um, uh, of something that the whole ecosystem could build around. Um, uh, because you know you may want to use Tokyo for one project, you may want to use uh, uh, async standard for another, and also if you want to build libraries, you want to build libraries that can work with both. Um, and there needs to be some sort of common language that they can talk between the two of them. Um, and uh, that has not really been settled, uh, unfortunately. Um, but um, if you today will kind of be. Uh, drinking from the async standard Kool-Aid a little bit and uh, assuming that the world is going to be built up around Futures RS and we'll see how we can maybe start creating a little bit of abstraction so that if other runtimes out there were to use Futures RS then um, our library possibly could work on top of them so in some ways we'll be creating um, a lot of our code will be will not know anything about async standard at all we'll just know about Futures RS um, okay, so looks like um, in chat, with, I'm not quite sure you can just use one or the other, can you? Can you explain uh, a little bit more about what you mean there? Um, if you're building an end application, you sort of, you probably want to choose one or the other um, because you're not going to want to have two runtimes at the same time. Um, that's going to be a lot of overhead. You probably just want to settle on one, um, which is why it's important that libraries kind of have talked to an abstract layer that doesn't care about which runtime it's running on. So then you can build up a, a bunch of, uh, um, uh, of libraries on top of this abstract layer and plug it into any runtime that you want, whether that's Tokyo or Async Standard. And there, are, there are other runtimes as well that are um, maybe not as general purpose as Async Standard or Tokyo are more focused on specific um, guarantees. Um, I think one of them, for instance, I just heard about is uh, Bast uh, Bastion. Um, and you'll have to excuse me too, my, my T key on my keyboard is not uh, really doing well right now. And no, I don't have one of those um, 2016 MacBooks with the uh, w with the screwed up keyboard. It's an older MacBook, but uh, you know, hey, if you eat while typing, sometimes food gets stuck in there. But anyway, this is Bastion. This is another um, runtime uh, that is sort of an alternative to async standard or to, to Tokyo. Um, it's, it's meant to be highly available and fault tolerant. So if you don't really need those uh, those particular or what it's offering up to you, then you maybe don't want to use Bastion. But at the same time, it's built on top of Futures RS. So if a library works with Futures RS, it can work on top of Bastion or on async standard. Um, and I guess it could work on Tokyo because I believe they have compat layers. But from what I've seen, they're moving further away from that, which is a bit sad. So um, yeah. That's uh, that's another runtime that you could uh, could look into. Okay, I've been talking way too much. Um, let's get into it. So we're going to be building a, a Redis uh, client today. Um, and for those that don't know what Redis is, it's basically like a a what do they call it? An in-memory uh, data structure store. So they, it comes with a whole bunch of of data structures like lists, um, maps. Uh, you know, it's basically mostly it started as a key value store, 
that it stores a memory. And of course you can set it up so that you flush that memory to disk, but it's basically meant to be um, non-persistent. So a lot of people use it as, um, as a cache and things like that. Um, and it has a whole bunch of features like built-in replication, scripting, you know, stuff like that. Um, but uh, we're going to be building a client for this that basically supports the, the bare minimum um, of what you might want to do with, uh, with Redis. And so we're going to look real quick at the commands that we have. And I think um, today the, the commands that we're going to be kind of focusing on are underneath this strings group. So we have, for instance, this, this git um, command here. It says git value by key. So if you have a, a value stored at a key, you can get it. Um, and if you want to set it down here, you set the, the value of a key. Um, and so uh, real quick, and I hope everybody can see this chat. Let me know if, uh, if you can't uh, see this. Um, so you can, there's a, a CLI that comes with Redis that you can use to, to interact with it. Um, and we can basically uh, uh, try some stuff out here. So if we want to, uh, let's say, get, um, uh, I heard, I saw a good Twitter thread that was saying foo is not the most uh, inclusive way to come up with random variable names because what the heck is foo? So um, variable. Um, so if we try to get some variable and it can be anything like get, uh, maybe we're storing a phone number by somebody's name. So if we try to get Brian here, it will be, be nil. Um, but we can set uh, Ryan to be, um, oh, let's set my age then. Uh, how old am I? I'm 30. And then if we go ahead and get Ryan again, 30 comes back. Um, so for now, what we're going to do is basically support a client where we can talk to Redis in this way. We can set values and we can get values. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff that, that Redis can do here. This is just the strings thing. If we look at all, there's a lot of commands that we can do. Um, because of how Redis works, most of these most of these are not that interesting to do once you know how um, get and set work because most of them work in a similar way. Um, so we don't really have to do a lot of these to really understand how Redis works. Um, I, I should mention now that there are plenty of other uh, uh, Redis libraries out there. Um, I think this uh, Redis RS one is, is kind of the most uh, common one. Um, this one has a synchronous and asynchronous um, uh, API built into it. And so if you look at the cargo.toml here, you can see that um, it depends on, on Tokyo. Um, so, uh, and, and not async standard, um, or um, uh, it does have future 0.1. We won't be using that, um, but uh, um, we're going to be going down a different route. And of course, when this was first developed, asynchronous Rust didn't exist at all. And then, you know, it came along and Tokyo was there. So it makes total sense that they, um, they went with Tokyo for this one. Um, I think there is another um, Redis implementation that I saw that's new. Uh, let me see if I can, yeah, dark Redis. Um, this I just found and it's fairly new um, and being worked on. And this I believe is the only um, kind of serious looking uh, Redis client that is based on uh, async standard. Um, so we can see here. Um, and you can use Tokyo as well. So they actually have some features where you can switch out which runtime you want to use, which is pretty cool. Um, so uh, I haven't used it, so I don't know like um, how feature complete it is and stuff like that. But uh, what we're building today isn't necessarily meant to be a real thing. It's more for learning. Um, I, I don't know if I necessarily have time to actually write a real Redis client, um, but um, I'll put it up on GitHub. And if people want to, to work on it, then we can build a little community. Um, but yeah, maybe some of these other projects could use um, your contribution as well. Cool. So more talking real quick before we get writing code, we have to figure out how does Redis actually work. Um, and here I am at redis.io slash documentation. 
Um, and down below here, here it is, Redis protocol specification. This is showing how the uh, RESP Redis serialization protocol works. Um, and it's, uh, this is bullet point number one, simple to implement, which is why we're doing this because it is simple to implement, um, which makes it really nice. Um, and uh, basically they have like, what is it? Uh, five data types here that you have to worry about. Um, and it's very simple. Um, uh, binary protocol is, it, it is a binary protocol, but it's also human readable as well. They don't, they only use um, characters that can be represented with, uh, with ASCII characters, which is really nice. And so um, this should be pretty uh, easy to do. So I think with all of that, I'm going to take a break, have a drink and ask the chat if there's any questions that they have. I do see there was one more uh, async standard. Does async standard support message framing? Um, I don't believe that there is built in support for message framing in async standard itself. Um, I could be totally wrong, um, but there is nothing about async standard that would make that not possible. And there's probably, I would assume there's a library um, for that, uh, but I'm not sure. If anybody knows, feel free to, to write in the chat. Um, cool. All right, uh, I guess there are no questions about what we're doing here. Um, so without further ado, then I think we can go ahead and get, get started. Um, as far as like what I expect you to know, I expect you to know like intermediate, like basic Rust. So you've read the book before. Um, if you have any questions though, feel free to ask. Um, if, if I type anything or say anything, like feel free to ask, totally cool. Um, cool. So we're going to, uh, uh, great. I have a fan club, which is awesome. And, uh, there's a question the Redis CLI gave the string version of 30 instead of 30. Yeah, that's true. That's, uh, that's because, um, get and set are string, uh, APIs. So it's going to store it as a string. It will store, uh, 30 as the character three and the character zero, not as you know, a single byte number 30. Um, although to be fair, I'm not sure if that's actually really true in the deep dark implementation of, of Redis, but at least over the binary protocol, that's true. Um, it will return everything as a string. Cool. So we're going to get started. Um, first we got to come up with a name real quick. So cargo new, um, Redis CLI is very boring, but we could go for that, if anybody has any suggestions, um, please write them in now. Otherwise, Redis CLI it will be. Gonna wait for the chat to catch up, but I assume no one's got any ideas. I'm gonna type it in, Redis CLI. Going once, going twice. Redis async, Redis async, Redis CLI. Uh, async Redis CLI is as boring as Redis CLI, but it has async in front of it. <laughs> uh, Redis async. Uh, um, all great suggestions. I think I'm going to stick with Redis CLI for now. We can change it. Um, and for now, we're going to do um, a binary. Um, just because it makes it a bit easier, but of course we can talk about how to, uh, remove, um, you know, and put it into a, to a library flamethrower RS. Nice. <laughs> Pretty cool. That would be cool. Uh, all right. So red a CLI, um, and then I'm going to open this up in code for now, just because, uh, all right. Um, and then let's just go ahead and run this real quick and get us hello world. And my, my computer is definitely struggling today. Um, I'm going to put in a sync off oh, the T key is going to kill me. Um, and I believe 1.1 1 .1 is out now, so we can do that. OK. 
come on. My computer is, oh, it is, it is chugging hard. Nope. Come on. Oh, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Might have to switch to Vim if, uh, if things go this way. Um, Yes, we can use cargo add. Uh, if you want to use cargo add to add it, feel free. I don't have cargo add installed and I just put in the numbers because I always forget about cargo add, but yeah. Um, do we need a parser library like nom? We could use nom. Um, and when we get to parsing, I'll ask the uh, yeah chat, let me know if you want to see, see nom. It's been a while since I've used it, but we can certainly give that a try. Um, or we could just try and parse it by hand. Um, and people are asking for font to go up. Is that better? All right. And I'm just going to go ahead and uh, run again just so that it builds. And actually, I should probably should do, let me do cargo check because we're probably going to use that more. All right. Cool. Um, okay, so what's the first thing that we need to do? Um, well, the first thing we need to know is how do we actually talk to the Redis server? And by the way, um, if you don't have Redis, I think on Mac, you can just install it, brew install Redis. Same on, on um, Linux, and I'm sure, you, uh, I don't believe that there's an official support for Windows, but um, yeah, I think there is something that uh, you can run Redis on Windows. Um, and uh, I have Redis running here. Um, uh, if I do, let's see. Um, yeah, here it is, and it's running running a server on, on localhost um, port 6379. Um, and it says here on the networking layer, client connects to Redis server creating a TCP connection to port 6379. So I think that's probably uh, the first thing that we're gonna do. And I'm being asked to go up one more in the font size. That is getting pretty big. So hopefully that's good. Um, Let me know if that works. Yes, the fan is whirring. Sorry about that. Uh, I do. I need a new MacBook. This this this, uh, this laptop is yeah going on almost five years now. Um, so that's that's not good. Uh, <laughs> I need a new one. But hey, I was waiting for them to fix the keyboard, and they did. So maybe I can get one now. All right. Um, yeah, I'm using, uh, I use a, uh, a Dell for my personal computer, um, but I was not very happy with it, to be honest, but that's neither here nor there. Cool, we're going to have to connect to uh, the uh, TCP uh, uh, socket, um, and uh, the first thing that we're gonna need for that is an async standard, um, and then I think it's in uh, net TCP stream. Oh, come on, keyboard. You can do it. Um, so we're going to get a uh, keep uh, TCP stream here, um, and I think uh, TCP stream has a connect on it, and then we can just pass in um, local host uh, six three seven nine like that, um, and it will complain at us that we are not using it, which is true. Um, so we can say, come on, stream. So um, this works. Uh, <laughs> I am using uh, VS Code with Vim bindings. I'm not using Vim, but I am using Vim bindings. Um, I am <laughs> a long-term Vim user, but I work at Microsoft now, so come on. Got to give a shout out every once in a while. Um, so the uh, TCP stream connect doesn't return back a stream, it returns back a future. That's because connecting to the TCP stream 
uh, actually takes a bit of time. Um, and so we uh, need to wait a little bit um, for that to happen. Um, normally in synchronous Rust, this would just block, um, block the main thread until um, the TCP stream actually was connected and then it would return back um, our stream struct to us. Um, but this is asynchronous Rust and we can't block. Um, and so uh, what we need to do is wait somehow, await for, for this future to, to finish. So we can do that by using this right here. We call dot await on it. And of course it's not going to work. Um, and the reason for that is in the error message, await is only allowed to be used inside of async blocks um, and stuff. And so if you've not done async before, you might go ahead and go, okay, I can do this then, right? Um, and that's all well and good. But uh, this, oh, if we go ahead and do this, this should compile now, um, but it's saying we're not using it, okay? So, uh, we can go ahead and say this, but like, okay, we get a future back here, but what if I run it, like, will this actually run? Let me go ahead and do print line hello here, just to see. And if we go down here and do cargo run um, and let it build for, for a second, um, then we will see if this thing actually goes ahead and, and runs hello. Um, and spoiler alert, since this is taking too long to build, um, it will not uh, actually go ahead and, and run that. And this is the most important thing to remember when you're thinking about futures, is that by default, Rust futures are inert. They're not like promises in JavaScript or, or some other um, uh, languages that have this built-in runtime. You can see here, nothing happened. Um, Rust doesn't have a built-in runtime because it uh, can't come with a runtime. It is a systems language. If it had to ship a runtime in every program, then it wouldn't be a very useful systems language. And so instead, we have to take our futures and give it to a, an actual um, executor to drive our futures to com completion. And that's exactly what async standard is, and of course, also what Tokyo is. Um, so, how do we actually go ahead and do this? And there are, are multiple ways um, to do this. And you can see um, we're gonna do that one real quick, uh, but before, oh, somebody send a pull, uh, pull request. This is a 404 now. But what we can do, um, and I believe, let me see, need to find where task is inside of, Uh, cool. Uh, and I think we can do, yeah, let's do that. So what we can do is say use async standard task. And then instead of assigning this here, we can say uh, task block on. And what this does, this block on, is it takes a, a, an async block and it drives that async block to completion, blocking the current thread until that async block is, is done. Um, and so this should work now. If we go ahead and run this, then ultimately we should see hello, and we do. Um, and so this works great um, and is, is totally fine. Um, I think there's one way that's a little bit nicer for, um, for async standard and to uh, Tokyo also has this uh, feature as well, um, is to go ahead and mark our main function as being asynchronous here. And this will basically just do what we just said, um, what we just wrote, but it will do it for us. Um, and so we can do this and uh, we don't need task anymore, which is great. Um, of course, we have to mark our main function as async now. Um, and so uh, we're getting a failure here because main actually, uh, async standard main doesn't exist because as you can see here, um, we have to uh, we have to use async standard with the attributes feature. And this gives us this attribute here 
to work with. So let's come back in here. Um, version features and too many T's in this word. And when we have that, then we can come back here um, and we have uh, main running then. Hopefully it's compiling now. And uh, we have a question about uh, connection errors and how to propagate that up. We'll, we'll touch on that in just a second. And it's a good thing that this is not included by default because anytime you put a macro, uh, proc macro in your crate, it's going to explode uh, compile times. And so they only, they put it behind a feature gate so that, um, you know, you have to explicitly uh, opt into it um, and we're paying for it now. Yeah, and currently uh, Chad is asking if we're only using async standard as a dependency and yes, we are. We are only using async standard as a dependency. Of course, async standard has a ton of dependencies itself, but um, we are only explicitly using async standard right now. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and get that running right there. Um, so um, we get another error that says, um, well, if we look uh, here, stream, now we can finally await on the stream, but stream is not quite yet a TCP stream, it's a result, because connecting to a TCP stream can actually error out, right? And so how do we, how do we handle that? Um, and if you've used await before, you know that it comes with a very nice handy feature where you can just use the, the good old question mark for it, and that will return back out the error to the calling function. But of course, we're in main, and main you know, doesn't take a result. But the nice thing is, is that we can do this. If we change our main to be this, and then down here, oops, return back okay of, uh, of unit, then, oh, and of course, we need to do that. And it doesn't know what IO is. And the nice thing about async standard is that it mimics the standard library. So you can basically, you could in theory have a completely synchronous um, uh, library and switch out all your standard uh, imports for async standard imports, and then just put dot awaits after everything that used to block and it should work uh, kind of. Um, like that's pretty cool. And so whereas IO, it's the same thing, that the same place that it's in standard, sta async standard IO. Um, and so this should work. We're now connecting to the TCP stream, awaiting on it. If it's an error, we return back the error. And if not, we get back the, the TCP stream. Here. So now we have a, a TCP stream. Cool. All right, so hopefully this makes sense to everybody. We now have a TCP stream, which is really great. Um, and what do we want to do? Well, um, I think the best way to actually see if this is working fine is to go ahead and use the best uh, Redis command. And let's hope I think it's documented in here. Um, and that command is ping. So um, what ping does is simply returns back pong. So we're going to send ping, get back pong. And ping also takes an argument. So you can provide an argument that it will echo back to you, but we're, we're not going to do that for right now. Um, and it looks like some people in chat were struggling a little bit getting this to work. You do have to remember that for dependencies, async standard, you have to turn on the attributes feature, which gives you this async standard main here. So make sure to do that. Great. So we need to somehow send ping and uh, hear back pong from it. So how do we do that? Well, in order to do that, we're going to look and see how commands actually get sent. And since I looked at this before, I know that they talk about this all the way down here, um, sending commands to Redis server. 
So um, it says we should be familiar familiar with the serialization format. We are not quite yet, but we'll get to that in just a second. Um, and it says simply a client sends the Redis service an RESP array. So we send some data type array containing bulk strings, which is another data type. And we'll look at how you serialize those in just a second. So presumably you send an array where every single thing in your, um, in your command is, uh, is a bulk string, whatever that is. And then the Redis server will simply return back um, something of RESP data type. So we have to learn how to serialize arrays and, and bulk strings. Um, so if we go up here and take a look at arrays, then we can see what the actual serialization format is. Um, and arrays are quite simple. So RESP arrays are sent using the following format. First, a asterisk character as the first byte, followed by the number of elements in the array as a decimal number, pretty easy, and followed by CRLF. So that's the carriage return new line. Um, and then an additional RESP type for every element of the array. So for empty arrays, it would be asterisk, then we have zero elements, and then we have new line, or a carriage return in new line. And for um, an array of two bulk strings, which we're gonna look at in just a second, we have asterisk two, carriage return new line, and then we have our data. So we need to look real quick at how to serialize these bulk strings as well. Um, and that's also pretty easy. Bulk strings are encoded in the following way. We do a dollar sign, which is great, followed by the number of bytes composing the string. So we have a prefix length. Um, and then we have CRLF, then the actual data, and then a final CRLF, okay? So we're just gonna write out this ping command by hand. Um, so we're gonna say let command equal and of course, we have to remember this is binary data, right? So we can't just put a string because then that's going to be encoded as um, uh, as uh, UTF-8. And um, in this case, that probably would be fine, um, except we don't want it to, it might be fine, but just to be safe, we're going to explicitly encode this as binary right here using B. And then we're going to send that command off. So going back again, we have to send uh, down here. It tells us in sending commands to the Redis server right here, a client sends the Redis server an RESP array consisting of just bulk strings. Okay, great. And we know what an array looks like. It is first the asterisk character, That's pretty simple. Then uh, it's followed by the number of elements in the array and we're just gonna be sing sending ping. So it's going to be one element. Um, and then we're going to follow it by CRLF. Uh, and that is going to be like this. So that starts off our, our array. We're good to go there. And then we have to send the elements um, as uh, bulk strings. And so again, bulk strings start with dollar sign, followed by the number of bytes composing the string. And let's think here, P-I-N-G is four. So we send four, terminated by CRLF, like this. Um, and then the actual string data, so P-I-N-G, and then a file, final CRLF. And that is the ping command that we're going to be sending to the server. And there's a question in chat. So the content between the quote with a B will be the binary content of what is in the source file. It depends on the encoding of the source file. Um, no, it will be the literal binary of each, uh, does it depend? That's a good question. If you were to put non-ASCII into those, uh, those things, what would happen? I'm not sure. We can take a look later and see what happens. 
but for now we're just going to send off this ping command. So we have our command and we need to send it over the TCP stream. Um, and for that we're going to take our stream and call write all on it and send the command. And let's take a look real quick at uh, TCP. And so TCP stream has a whole bunch of stuff on it here. Um, but what we really are interested in are these reads and writes. These are extremely important. These reads and writes are async read and async write that, that they're basically re-exported from the futures, uh, futures IO uh, library. That's part of the, uh, part of futures RS. Um, and what these represent is basically the asynchronous version of the read and write trait that's inside of uh, the standard library. Um, and so if we look at writes, um, here are kind of the low level things that you have to implement if you want to implement um, write. And then you'll get a bunch of these things for free, like write, flush, write vector, write all. And we want write all because it writes an entire buffer into the byte stream. So we give it a byte stream and it will just take it and keep on calling write. It will keep on calling the syscall write until it writes everything in it. If you just call write the plain write and not write all, it writes some bytes, however many the, the operating system wants you to or allows you to, and then it returns back the size of the bytes that it's, that it's written. And so if you want to write out everything, you have to loop over and continually call write until you basically get back uh, zero as your result, um, but write all does that for us. So we're just gonna we're just gonna use write all. Um, and uh, we are getting a an error here. Um, the error is not quite as clear, I believe, as it would be if we ran it down here with cargo check. So we can do that real quick. Um, but um, basically, write all is coming from a trait here, um, and so uh, we do not have these uh, methods uh, available to us unless we bring in that trait. Um, and here is uh, it's telling exactly what we need. Um, we need the the following trait to be uh, in scope for us to be able to to use this this write extension trait. Um, unfortunately, um, the write extension uh, trait is n private or right here, so we can't just copy paste this. Unfortunately, the best way to get at it is by doing this async standard prelude, and this just has a whole bunch of helpers in it that um, that you're going to need, um, and that allows us to go ahead and write it. Um, Seems like on ch chat, some people are getting some buffering on Twitch. I'm really sorry about that. It might be my computer is not keeping up today. And if that's the case, I'm, I'm super sorry. Um, but there's not much I can do about it. Um, and I am, in, I am in Europe, so your mileage may vary if you're far away from Europe. Um, but uh, all right. So we're getting an error here and it's saying, hey, you're trying to mutably write into the stream, you're trying to change it, but it's not marked as mutable, so we need to go ahead and say it's mutable. All right. And it looks like um, that is actually working. Um, the issue with this though, is that this write all is asynchronous. So we are writing to the stream, but then we're kind of forgetting about it. And what we would like to do is kind of say, write to the stream and on the next line, only write hello when you've written to the stream uh, completely. And so in order to do that, of course, we need a wait like this. And now it's telling us, hey, write all can fail. Which is true, writing to a TCP stream doesn't always work, um, so we need to handle that error. Um, but for us, we're just going to propagate that error back up into main, and then it will splat out something to standard error if something goes wrong. 
So now we've we've waited there, um, and write all actually returns back a unit, so we don't really have to like store anything from it. So we're good there. So hopefully this works. Um, let's go ahead and run it and see if at least it doesn't explode. Great, cool. So presumably we wrote to uh, Redis and it wrote back something to the TCP stream. Well, probably not because the TCP stream got disconnected soon afterwards. But what we would like to do now that we've written onto the TCP stream the command, we want to read back from that TCP stream the response that we get back. So let's go ahead and do that. And of course, the, what we need is the dual to write. So instead of write, we need read. Um, and you can see read here. And read has kind of similar-ish um, uh, methods like read to end and stuff like that. So what we can do then is, uh, but before I get into that, um, when we read to end, it's important to note that we're reading into a buffer of some sort. So we're going to need to allocate some buffer. And then when we call read to end, we'll take the bytes from the TCP stream and we'll write them into that buffer. And all that uh, read to end returns back is how many bytes it wrote into, um, into our buffer. So uh, in order to read, what we need is a buffer of some sort. And the easiest way to get that is by creating a vec of some sort. Um, and we're going to, if you have used vectors before, you know that they're, uh, if you just call vec like this, um, it creates an empty vector. And what we need is a vector with some, some room in it, right? We need, a, we need a, a vector that has place for us to write into. Um, and, uh, read to, to end will not grow the vector um, if it's not big enough. And so we actually need to initialize this to be something like a vector with zeros in it. Um, and how big is it going to be? We can, a common thing to do is like a kilobyte, 1,000.4. So now we have a vector, it's completely empty. We're going to be mutating it. And we need to write uh, read from our stream and we're going to call read, uh, what is it, read to end, um, passing in a mutable reference to our buffer. Just like that. Um, ah. All right. Um, so read to end is very similar to write, uh, write all up here. Um, it's asynchronously reading from the TCP stream. So of course, if we want to actually see what was being read, we need to await on it. We need to say, hey, wait here until this thing is completely done. Um, and the next thing is it also returns a result. And so we want to do question mark again. Um, unlike write all, read to end returns back something. It doesn't just return unit. It actually returns back. Uh, yep, it returns back u size, um, which is the amount of bytes that it, it actually uh, read from the stream and put into the buffer. So we can say bytes read, and this is important because we have a vector with a thousand twenty four um, bytes in it. A lot of those are zeros, and if we want to know exactly, just like give us the data that um, is important to us, um, then uh, we need to know where our data actually ends. Um, and so now I think the most important thing to do is to go ahead and uh, print out the result that we got back. Um, so we're going to print line, uh, and then we'll look at our buffer, and we'll look from the very beginning until bytes read and see what it gives back to us. Um, let's see. Oh, 
probably shouldn't shouldn't need that. Um, let's see. Same here. Let's take a look here. Um, and it's saying that uh, we're reading from the buffer, but we are uh, getting back an unknown um, size of, of bytes here, which is uh, a bit strange. Um, I think what we need to do instead, instead of having like an owned uh, buffer here, we need to go ahead and read from the uh, Hmm, what is going on here? Well, not exactly sure what's happening. Let's just look at the buffer then. Um, and that's true. So we can look at this. So now we're just going to look real quick at the entire buffer. And if we go ahead and run this, then For some reason, it is just stuck. So we have an issue here. We are uh, sending something to the server, and we're getting back, uh, and it's it's just hanging. When we run it, it's never completing. Um, so something uh, is not working right here, um, and. My suspicion is that we are using the wrong thing here. We're using read to end, which is basically trying to fill the entire buffer. And instead, what we need to use is, is read. So read to end is literally trying to read as much at every single, as much from the uh, stream as it can, so it completely fills buffer. And read instead reads back um, a certain thing from, uh, from the byte stream. So let's just call this instead. And they have the same type signature, so we should be good there. And we can run this now. And you can see it worked. Um, we didn't really get a, a very good um, output here, obviously, because we're printing the entire buffer. Um, and of course, we're printing the bytes as decimal numbers, which is also um, not that helpful. Um, and so we, what we probably want to do uh, instead is go ahead and um, read only the first uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bytes or so, however many bytes uh, read are, and just read that uh, as a string. Um, and so reading something as a string is quite simple. Um, if we call standard stir from UTF-8, um, then we hand in uh, a buffer. And this basically tries to read the string um, as, uh, as UTF-8 then. Um, and, uh, and this should work. Of course, we're going to get um, a whole bunch of garbage at the end again, but at least we'll be able to see the beginning. And we can see we got Pong. Here. So that's good. Um, this should work. To do this instead. There we go. So now we're just taking the, the buffer from zero until bytes read. Um, and reading it out um, as a string. So, and then of course, when we reach right here, 
um, stream will be dropped, and when stream is dropped, then the TCP connection is closed, um, which is good. So we um, we are almost done. Um, what we're going to do uh, here is say is we're going to now parse um, our our response. So let's do that real quick. So instead of printing it. Uh, as a string, oops. Instead of printing it as a string, we're going to head it and pass it to a function that parses it and gives us back some kind of meaningful um, response. So what we're going to do is uh, call a like parse parse response um, and pass in um, buffer. It's red. Um, and for now, what we're assuming is that the what is available in buffer is a full response. That's not going to always be true. So at some point, we're going to need to um, d decide somehow how, like, do we have a full response or something like that, or do we need to actually read more? So like, we need. Uh, the ability to basically chunked um, uh, read a chunked response. Um, all right. So let's call parse response then. And parse response is going to take in a buffer of u8. And it's going to return a result. Um, and let's have it take a return a string um, or uh, string as an as an error. Then, and we can clean this up in a little bit. And so we need to look what what these responses actually look like. Um, so we go down here again to here it is, sending commands to, to the Redis server. Um, you can see that the Redis server replies to client sending any valid RESPT, RES, RESP data type as a reply. Um, so any of these values here um, can be returned back. Um, and I think that the first thing that we're going to do is uh, there, this errors type is kind of um, special. Um, so we want to look at that and see if it's an error. And if it's an error, then we can return back the, the result error type. And otherwise, then we can parse it as, as something else. Um, so all we have to do here is, uh, what we can do is just say, if buffer dot is empty, um, then we can return. So we can just get rid of that possibility and say, return error. Um, Empty buffer, empty bugger. So that will at least uh, handle um, an empty buffer that we're getting past. And then we can say if buffer zero equals, and we'll look at uh, B. And we can see here that errors, the first byte of the reply is um, minus sign or hyphen. So we can do that. Say if the first thing in the uh, in the buffer is this hyphen, then we can return back uh, return error. Um, and we can say, how about we say format um, error response. And of course, this is not the best way to do this um, for now. It's fine. Um, and we can say this is this is cheating and, and doing a whole bunch of uh, um, stuff here that uh, you know we are s assuming things that we can't really assume, like that the, the buffer is full and stuff like that, um, and that we have a, co a complete response buffer here. Um, but what we can do um, is say, 
take the buffer from one, so skip over the first byte that we already know what it is, and then go all the way up to buffer dot len, uh, and then I believe this would be minus two right here. So we want to skip over the um, uh, R the CRLF at the end of our response. Um, All right, and uh, then we can say, okay, uh, buffer, um, we want to do standard stir as UTF, uh, from UTF eight. And for now, we'll just go ahead and think for now, we'll just unwrap if that fails and say from one um, all the way up to buffer.len minus two. Yeah, we're gonna add uh, tests for this for sure. Cool. So yeah, we need to pass in a reference there. Um, and we can't display it, so but we can do this. And that should work. Mm, and here what we can do think this should work, but it might not. Yeah. Um, I know that chars are actually represented as um, four byte wide, um, always. So it's not represented internally as, as UTF-8. Um, cool, then we can print line here, and we'll just go ahead and take a look at it, see what it returns back to us. Oops. <sighs> Having all kinds of typing issues today, sorry about that. Great, it worked. So let's review real quick what we did here. We, on line seven here, connected to, to a TCP stream. We awaited until we actually did the connection. If it was an error, we propagated that up. We hand wrote our um, command here. Um, then we wrote it out to the TCP stream and awaited it. Then we created a buffer so that we could read into. We call red on it. Um, and at first we were calling uh, read to end, but we learned that read to end tries to read until it completely fills the buffer. And we don't want that. And so um, we see how many bytes that we've read. Then we parse the response um, that we get back just from zero until the bytes are read. And parse the response, we take a look at the buffer and if it's empty, then something's gone really wrong. Um, if, it, if the first uh, uh, byte inside of the buffer is hyphen, then it's an error, and we go ahead and return back an error. And otherwise, then we return back the string um, uh, that is contained inside of it, not including the first character and the uh, last two characters. Um, so that should do that. Um, question for for a chat. Um, what would you like to see now? Should we create a, a more complex um, uh, command like set, for instance, that takes arguments 
um, or should we um, focus more on parsing here and see if we can parse things instead? I think probably working on set would be the right thing to do. How does everybody think about that? Can also start creating a command struct as well. All right, we'll do set for now. And I think we're gonna hold off on a command struct for now, um, but it might be interesting um, instead of having to write out our commands like this to have um, an enum that is this uh, RESP value enum. So something like this that can represent all the different types that we have. So we have a simple string, um, which for now we can put into a string here. And we have errors. Um, and we'll put in uh, um, and what we're going to be doing here is have RESP value own all of its data. So it will be inside of strings, it will be inside of vex and stuff like that. Um, this is not necessarily the most performant way to do this, but for now, this is how we're going to be doing it. Um, then we have integers. Uh, and I think integers are just going to be. 64, they might be I64, we'll have to look. Um, bulk string, and that's going to be binary data and arrays. And arrays are just going to be a vec of rest values. Cool, so now, um, what we can do is have something that basically builds these uh, commands for us. So we can do something like impl uh, resp value fn, I don't know, serialize, um, and it's going to take a resp value and it's going to return back a vec of u8s. So it's just going to return back a vector with all the bytes um, set into it for that value. And so, of course, we can match on self. Um, and for ping, what we needed was two things. So we'll do those first. We needed an array, and there should be arrays, uh, not array, and not integers. Array. Um, oops. Oh, come on, computer. You can do it. Um, so if we have an array, we know what we need to do first is up here, we needed to write this, the star and then the length. So we need to create our, our buffer that we're going to write to. Um, we'll just create it like that. And then we'll say uh, buff. We can do um, buff dot push. Mm, how do we want to do this? Might actually be good to do uh, because buffer also takes uh, also implements read uh, or write. Sorry, we can we can just write to it. So we can say write uh, star. Like this, and then we can say write values dot len, and we need to make that an actual string value, so we can format that like that, and then of course this is going to return back a string, um, and what we want instead is as bytes, like 
like that. Um, oh, sorry, not there. There. And bytes. Okay. Um, these should never fail. Um, I believe they should never fail as long as we have enough room. Um, hmm. This is tough. Um, yeah, let's do this for now and we can t take a look to see what it looks like. Um, yeah, Chad is asking to do, to do push instead. That's actually the better way to do this because it grows the vector along, but I just wanted to, to try this out real quick. Um, with this, with this, what we would have to do instead is, uh, you know, guess at what the size would be. And if we're wrong, then it would panic and stuff like that. So, okay, fine. We'll go back to it. To doing that instead, we'll do push. Um, the issue with push, though, is that push only takes one element at a time, right? Um, so we, and I don't believe Vec has like a, a push all or anything like that, does it? Uh, oops. Last Vec. Um, yeah, I don't believe that there is, any kind of thing to push a whole collection of things into. Uh, we could do append, but that takes a vector as well, and what we really want is to pass an immutable slice, and I don't believe that there is something to do that. But if um, take chat, let me know if you can think. Yeah, and I see chat now is recommending append. I don't know if we want to do append, but um, we we certainly can do it. It's, I mean, we're being probably too uh, careful about uh, performance for this little toy Redis client here, so. Um, and well, in some areas and in other areas not. So, um, all right, so we're pushing this on, then we can go ahead and um, I think there's a two rec. And we want to append. We don't need to unwrap anymore. Um, great. By the way, underneath here, let's just do this now so we can get rid of the error. We'll return buff. Um, all right. So let's see real quick. Need to turn turn string into oh. Come on, keyboard is killing me. We need to turn uh, string into um, into a vector. There's from UTF-8. Uh, into bytes, there it is. Into bytes. All right. And that expects a mutable reference here. Okay. Um, what error are we getting now? It's 
saying we're getting Vec. Ah, yes. Um, because we want. I believe we can do this. Yep, it's saying we're not covering everything. Uh, so we can just say unimplemented. And that should take care of it. All right. So we're getting somewhere now. So we have the the array. We're pushing on the, um, the asterisks. We're pushing on the length. Um, if we go back here down to array, um, we can see um, that we need the CRLF now. Um, and I'm just going to do this. Oops. First one is the carriage return, and then the line feed. So that's good. And then we need to go over for value and values and call uh, value dot serialize. So this will recursively serialize uh, the um, this will recur recursively serialize the values inside of the array. And this brings up a good point, like. We're going to be creating new buffers at each time. And of course we can append the two buffers uh, t together. Um, and, oh, can you do this? Fabulous, awesome, great, thanks chat. Um, so I think maybe what we should do is take in a buffer here and say that this is going to be like this, and then we don't have to return, and we can just recursively send down um, the buffer. Yeah. Called it buff before. Call it keep it with buff. Recursively send down the buffer. Um, whoops. Needs to be a vec. Sorry. Cool. Um, and then I want to say we don't have to end the any yeah. So we don't have to end it, it here. So that's good. And then um, we need a bulk uh, string, right? So resp value bulk string. Uh, come on, T. You can do it. And we're going to have to do the same thing. So um, just like we did above, the bulk string here is dollar sign, then the length of the string, then uh, CRLF, then the data, then CRLF. So let's do that. So it's basically going to look very similar to this. Um, so instead of asterisks, I'm going to do dollar sign, then data here, and then CRLF, um, and then we need to basically append the data. Oops. Um, and here's a here's another interesting question that we have here. Um, we want we basically want to take the data and write it into our buffer. Um, the way that append uh, normally works is that it takes a mutable reference into to another vector and basically like takes the stuff from one 
uh, vector and puts it into another. Um, but of course, serialize is just taking um, the resp value by immutable reference, and then we're trying to like take the data out of it, which won't work, right? Um, and there's several ways that we could fix this. We could clone. We could clone the co uh, stuff. We can, you know, take mutable reference, but then that's weird. Like I think the best way is just serialize. We'll we'll own. We'll basically take the um, the rest value by uh, by ownership, and then it can do whatever it wants uh, with it. Then um, oh, we forgot to keep an unimplemented here. So now we own data, we can do whatever we want with it. Um, and as long as we mark it as mutable, whoops. Come on T, you can do it. Cool. So that's pretty easy. Um, and then I think the last thing we're missing is after we write out the data, we got to do another CLRF uh, like that. Cool. So then now we can replace our uh, command here um, with let buffer equal vec. Um, and then the command will be uh, resp value array. And this is going to take in a vec of resp value uh, bulk string and we're going to do ping like this and fortunately we got to do into vec on it um, there's a two vec like this all right um, and of course Buffer, we got to pass in there. And, uh, what does it say in here? Pass in as a reference. Um, and of course, this wouldn't work. We created a buffer, we created a command, but we got to like write the command into the buffer, right? So, what we can do is say command dot serialize and pass in the buffer like this. Now we will serialize uh, the command. We're not marking it as mutable. Very sorry, Rust. We will do that for you. And that should do it. And hopefully what happens now is that we just get back Pong again. Let's see. Yay, Pong. Cool. OK. Um, that's basically just a convenience for us so that now we can build uh, our, com our commands in these kind of more declarative ways um, and not have to build up like, you know, um, build up the, the byte stream or the, the byte buffer like by hand, but we can just have the serialize uh, method do it for us. Awesome. Okay, so now let's do set real quick so we can take a look at set inside of our commands. Do we have commands here? Yeah. Commands. And what does set do? Set, set, set. So set takes a key and a value and then some uh, optional arguments. We're going to, to just send um, key and value for now. So our command is still going to be an array um, like it always has been. Um, and this time what we're going to do instead of passing in P is we're going to pass in set. If I can type T. And we want to have another resp value bulk string. And we're going to, um, what are we going to do? Let's do uh, Ryan, that's the key. Guess I'm being narcissistic today. Uh, to back, to back. And rest value bulk string. 
Um, uh, let's see. What's a good one? Berlin. That's where I live. So this is going to be a key value store of first names to locations. Uh, to back. All right. So now that's set and we should be able to run and see what we get back from. And we just got back okay, which is great. Um, if we, we expect, we expect it okay, um, which is good. Uh, that means it's been set. Um, and this is great. We can start building up. Um, let's let's do like a little function here. Just says set, and it's going to take in um, key. And hmm, we'll do key as a string and value as a string for now. Um, not sure if keys and values in Redis have to be ASCII or not. Um, that would be something that if we were actually building this, we would want to look into. Um, and we're going to return a result um, of nothing. It was a success. Um, or let's just say error for now on. We're going to have our own error type. Cool. Um, and so what we want to do is actually just take this command and put it down here. So we have to ask ourselves, what is going to be the, the actual API for what we're doing here? And do we want, presumably we want set to actually go ahead and make the call, right? Um, but we need extra information, like we need the TCP stream to be able to send on and stuff like that. So really, we probably want um, a struct called client that's going to hold on to that, that TCP stream like this. And then we have access to it and can do whatever, whatever we want with it, right? Um, but of course, we know when we send, when we send um, something off over the TCP stream that um, we we want it to be asynchronous, right? We don't want it to um, to block our current thread. That's the whole point of why we're doing this. So we can go ahead and mark it as, as async. And now all of a sudden um, it's asynchronous. Of course, we should go ahead and return OK here. And now that we have that, we can actually make this a method uh, instead of a free-floating function. And that means that this can take self now instead. And this is all looking good. So then all we need to do is take what we had here, right? Um, and this should, uh, should work. Great. Um, yeah, we're getting a real quick, uh, message here saying that, um, when, when you call question mark, what that does is it tries to convert the error that it's seeing in the error result into the error that you have up here. And so the error that we're getting back is an IO error, um, but we have no way of turning an IO error into our custom error type that we have here. Um, and so it tells us exactly what we need to do. Um, we need uh, standard convert from. So we want impl standard convert from IO error for error. Um, and I believe it 
should just be like this. Um, and for now, since we don't really care what it is, we can just return that. Great. Um, Let's make this a struct for now. We can think about error handling in, in just a second. So um, this seems to be seems to be good. Um, now all we have to do here is uh, oh, we should probably have a convenience method on client like new. Uh, and um, I think, oops, simple client. The best thing for us to do probably is to take in what uh, TCP connect takes in. So this to address, uh, address soccer, socket. Um, and that way we can just create a can create a TCP socket on our own. This is going to be, oh my gosh, IO error. This is great. Well, that means we can basically just take all this stuff here. Not all that, just this. just copy it in like that cool so we need to we need to where is it two adders where is that thing two socket two socket Stand, async standard net yeah cool Right? And of course, pass in our adder. Ugh. All right, and this gives us a stream. And we can say client stream. And the last thing we need to do is wrap it in OK. Everything has worked out. Cool. So this is our new client. We can create our client. So let's do that up here and say, instead of this, we'll say client, client new, um, localhost, what is it, 66739, six, was that it? 6379. 6379. So now we have our our client here, and we can call client.set and say Ryan Berlin. And because of because we've said we take strings for now, we have to turn these these uh, string slices into strings, but we can take care of that in a little bit of how to, to make that nicer. Um, and of course we need to await, and we need to await. Let's keep this thing. So, and the last error that we're getting is again, we can't convert from um, our error back into an IO error. 
Um, so let's just go ahead and for now we can just print that out. And just take a look at it. Alright. Ah yes, we need it to implement debug just in case it's an error that we want to show on the screen. So derive debug. And hopefully that takes care of it. Great. All right. Um, so let's finish up our set real quick. So we want set like that. Um, we want our key now to be key into bytes. And we want our value to be value dot in two bytes. And then we have our buffer, we serialize our command. Um, we need now to actually make this mutable here. Um, we can take care of that so in the future we don't have to do that, but for now, let's leave it like that. Um, because we're actually changing the stream and thus changing our client every time we call set. Um, then we write it out. Um, presumably we want to uh, read back from, uh, sorry, Get this mute real quick. We want to read back from the stream again to, to make sure that we, uh, to make sure that um, everything is okay. Um, and so what we could do is stream read. Could try and reuse the, the buffer that we have here um, and see if that works. Let's do that for now. So we get back bytes red. And of course, for now, what we can do is take a look at our buffer. So if buffer zero equals Um, do we, we could, no, we could use parse response Let's do that. We've already written on this already. So, um, parse response, parse response, and we're going to pass the, the buffer now, um, all the way up to bytes red. Um, and basically parse response is just going to check, like, was it an error or not? So we can just pass it back up and let's, let's make this take a error. And for now, our error handling is obviously leaves a lot to be desired, but we can just do this for now and add variants for all this stuff later on. All right. Oh. Great. So, assuming everything is okay, then what we should see here is just okay. Everything is good. Like okay, tuple. Uh, so let's see. Awesome. And then if we say Redis CLI, get Ryan, it said it's Berlin. Awesome. So we have done a pretty good job there.
and we're starting to get into a, like having an actual implementation that we can expand and stuff like that. So there's a lot to um, improve on here. Um, I think what we'll do real quick is just implement Git, and then we can talk a little bit about how we would improve this, and then we'll call it a day, nice and short stream. Um, but there's lots that we, we can do to improve it. So let's just do, and uh, chat, feel free to um, ask any questions or comments or anything like that while we do git. So git is just gonna take a, a value here. Oops. Um, and it's just going to be git here and there's gonna be no value. And we still have a buffer here. We serialize it, we write it out, then we read it back. Um, and then we want the actual response to be here. Um, and what we're getting back from response here is based on the buffer. So again, this is not the best way to do it, but we can do this for now. Take that buffer and just copy it onto the heap as a string. And that should do it. So then up here, we can just say, we're going to set uh, unwrap and client.get Ryan dot unwrap, and of course, oh wait. And we probably want to put that out just so we can see what it, it says. All right. Cool. So let's go ahead and change this to uh, I'm originally from Tampa, so we can go ahead and say that. And if we go ahead and run this, we'll see what it says. Tampa, yay, awesome. Um, great, do we have another, oops. Interesting. I think our parser is slightly off. We're getting five here, um, so there's there's something to be worked on there. But uh, but this is already getting to a point where it's it's sort of working. So that's wonderful. So um, let's go ahead and uh, end the stream with what we can do to improve this. Um, so we have the stream and we're just we're just holding on to it normally like this um, but that means that anytime that we uh, mutate the stream we have to say that we're mutating the client but really the stream is kind of just a um, uh, implementation detail that we're never going to pass back out um, and so what we want uh, to do in instead maybe is to wrap this thing up in, um, in something that allows us to, um, to check the, uh, the runtime rules um, or check the borrow checker rules at, at runtime. Um, so going ahead and putting this inside, in sort of uh, inside of a ref cell or something like that. Um, there was a question about unwrap as well. Unwrap is basically just taking an error and uh, um, if it's an error, panicking, and if it's not, returns that value. Um, yeah, other than that, there's there are some, uh, we obviously need a proper parser, so we need to go through and um, parse our responses um, more correctly. Um, for instance, we probably should jump through the response and if we um, 
don't get back a full response, then read again on uh, on the TCP stream. Um, I believe that uh, Redis, I mean, Redis can chunk its responses back to the client. So we probably should be prepared from that. Right now we're just assuming that we get it all in, in one go. Um, and the nice thing about the way that responses are returned um, is that for arrays and stuff like that, um, you are getting the length uh, up front. So basically you can just go to the length, jump ahead to that, um, ensure that there's a, um, uh, a uh, CRLF right after that, and then you, know, you don't have to look at the values in between. So you don't have to scan the entire response in order to parse it. Um, yeah, obviously other than that, we need uh, a nicer error type. Um, we need uh, to support more of our resp values um, and more commands and stuff. Um, but in the end, what we have here is more or less a working um, Redis client. There's not much more to it. Um, uh, we already uh, support um, pipelining um, in the fact that as long as the client is alive, the TCP stream will be alive. And so uh, if you do uh, we call set uh, and get here, and we're sending those both of the, the same TCP stream. Um, we don't create a new connection, uh, which is somewhat of an advanced feature in a lot of other uh, um, uh, clients, uh, Redis clients. That's kind of just falls out of our implementation here, almost for free. Um, and uh, that's about it. Um, so I think. Um, if there are no more questions from the chat, um, this is it. I'll get feedback, I, I think, on online to see what you thought about this. Um, and uh, if you would like to see more of the Redis client, um, I had uh, a couple of more ideas for streams, um, like uh, creating a, a small binary, dependency-free binary for displaying um, uh, PNGs on a Mac. Um, so really just calling only into the, the operating systems, APIs directly. Um, uh, we might not be able to do it on, on a Mac if they're only exposed through an Objective-C um, API, so we might have to do it on Linux instead. Um, but um, that would be one thing. Um, there's a ton of other things that we can do as well. So I hope this was useful for you. I hope it wasn't too fast or too slow. Um, and uh, it was definitely a lot of fun. So thank you very much.